Hello, friends. <laughs> Welcome to Jumpstart. Um, we are here today for uh, something that I'm just super, super excited about. Um, when I say our friend Mike Caulfield is here, I truly mean our friend Mike Caulfield um, because Keene State, we take full credit for all of Mike Caulfield's subsequent achievements in life because we feel like we grew him. Um, Mike, uh, it, Mike it not only um, was at Keene, but also you know, has, still has family in the area and is in many ways a New Hampshireite. Um, so it's really exciting to have him back uh, since leaving Keene. Um, he really has developed an international re um, reputation for working with students in projects that help students develop digital literacies, but also make our digital environments healthier for everybody. Um, so that kind of like environmental stewardship of this wacky thing called the internet is something that uh, lurks underneath all of Mike's pedagogical ideas for working with students. Um, I said to Phil when I was talking about, oh, I'm so excited Mike's coming. I said, I think he is the smartest person I know who says things that I'm still interested in listening to. Because a lot of times the smarter people get, the more I'm like, dude, don't care. You know, just don't care. You're so smart and specialized that I really not even, you know, engaged anymore. Um, but Mike has a, a really excellent way of making complicated ideas feel simpler, um, which I think will be great for us today, but it's also great because that's a lot of what I think a lot of us strive to do with our students is that we don't want to water down um, or uncomplicate complex issues, but we do want to find ways, especially in online environments, to make them feel accessible. So um, I hope you will join me in welcoming Mike. I do wanna tell you that um, Mike is, uh, I'm going to put into the chat, which I, I'm actually gonna suggest you not open this link, um, but if you do have accessibility issues, um, especially in terms of hearing, you may wanna open this because it's a bit of an outline of what he's going to cover because he's going to be uh, whiteboarding it a little bit more so we don't have the live captions. I will open the live captioning and drop in some notes there. So for folks who need those, you can follow along there. So with that, I'll mute myself and turn it over to Mike. Also, uh, Robin, uh, in the interim while Martha was speaking, I was of course listening to Martha because Martha is always brilliant. Uh, but um, uh, I also figured out a way. Um, so, so a little story that will be familiar to everybody that teaches online in terms of unexpected uh, situations, um, we use, uh, Zoom's live captioning at WSU, and I assumed we were going to use Zoom's live captioning. I didn't know we were using uh, Google Slides uh, to live caption, uh, but I think I have figured out a way. And actually, uh, while Mike's doing this, let me just um, hack catch people up. I think on. I have figured out a way to hack in um, Google Slides live captioning onto a, a Microsoft OneNote presentation. You did so it. Hopefully. Mike, can you hear me? Um, yeah. So this is fantastic. It looks great. Okay. And that's awesome. I also just want to, because I, I answered some private questions in the chat. Um, I wanted to let Plymouth State folks know that the Zoom, the free Zoom live captioning is not yet available. And they when it is, which is supposed to be soon, we will have access. But right now, Plymouth doesn't have access um to a uh, live captioning um what we were doing before for folks who are interested is if you just build your slides in google slides and show them with chrome you can flick a little switch and get those to automatically appear which is helpful to know in the interim till we get a better captioning service so right. thanks mike for hacking this together no surprise yeah so this is uh this is all smoke and mirrors, of course. This is the one note, and we just have a blank Google <laughs> slide here in the background that we're laying this on top. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this works. Uh, but but please uh, do uh, bear with me as we try this little experiment. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, explanations, uh, and I, I want to first talk about where explanation fits. In, in some ways, explanation is. 
uh, explanatory videos uh, are not the uh, they're not the uh, they're not the hippest uh, sort of uh, business. If you think about the things that we try to do with educational multimedia, um, uh, the way we talk about it at WSU is we want to uh, con uh, look at having a little trouble there. Connect. Uh, we want to connect, right? So you make an intro video. You try to connect with your students. You try to um, uh, get them to care about the subject. Uh, you try to uh, show them that you're invested in their success. Very important use of, of uh, video in your classes. Um, two, uh, what we'll be talking about today, uh, which is uh, uh, explain, right? So you're trying to explain various concepts uh, to your students. You're trying to help build their understanding. So, and uh, you know, in three uh, educational multimedia, try to uh, engage, right? You're trying to get them to um, practice uh, their understandings uh, and uh, also engage in the sense of finding their own sorts of connections to the content, right? Processing it and uh, really integrating it uh, into their own understandings, right? So connect, explain, and engage. And I, I, in some ways, the more passionate stuff is always the connection really important stuff too. If you're going to make one video in your class, make a course intro video that just tells the students, hey, this is why the class is going to be great. This is why I love the subject. Um, and I am here and I am invested in your success and we are going to do everything we can to make sure you succeed. If you're going to do one video, right, you're going to want to do this connection video. Um, getting students to engage some of these high flex models uh, that, that uh, we talk about, of course, students cannot learn unless they engage, unless they actually uh, practice uh, the material, unless they apply it, right? Absolutely. But I will tell you this, if you're creating videos, right? And you do both of these things, you connect with your students, you give them opportunities to practice uh, the material. Uh, and your explanatory videos just are completely incomprehensible to the student, Okay, the student will not succeed. Uh, and I think a, a lot of people are seeing their, their, their own children now um, uh, at home struggling with their courses, right? This, this is the, I don't know, actually in New Hampshire, it's a little bit different. Um, but um, I'll tell you as a parent, you know, I, I, I now watch this with my kids. And when a teacher has an explanation up that makes sense, you know, the, the, you know, I watch my daughter and she's, she's succeeding, she's thriving. When she, you know, when it, whatever time it is, probably a little too late uh, for, 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 uh, for the class, but uh, when she's pulling up that video under stress and trying to make sense of it, and she just cannot understand uh, what the point the professor is trying to make is, um, it, it's, it's, frustrating at a level, I think, uh, that, that maybe we may, might not understand. Uh, bad explanations always kind of suck, but bad explanations when you're alone at home, you're isolated from students, you don't have a follow a way to have a direct follow-up question, you're watching it at 10 at night, and you have something due at 11 at night. Um, it's a level of maybe I'm not cut out for this class. Maybe I'm not cut out for college. You know, maybe I don't belong here. It's a level of that that I think we don't comprehend. So it's important while connection is important, while engagement and practicing those skills are important, when you actually produce uh, explanatory videos, the quality of the explanatory video um, matters quite a bit, right? Um, so I want to start first with an example of uh, what to avoid. I put together a not so good, um, a not so good uh, 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 explanatory video as a sample, um, which turned out to be very easy to produce, right? To, to make a example, uh, <laughs> a poor video. Um, but uh, here, here's an example of a, of a video that uh, doesn't do a particularly good job um, making use of uh, the affordances. Affordances is just a fancy way of saying kind of like features, right? Um, affordances of video. So hopefully the live captioning will actually come through as I'm playing the video as well. 
2018, an interesting note ran under a column by Barry Weiss, a New York Times columnist. Uh, it read, Edgar's note, March 7, 2018, an earlier version of this essay cited criticism of the commenter, Dave Rubin. Uh, Mike, turn up your volume a bunch. A lengthy tweet that described him as a fascist. Uh, came from an account yeah. that has been reported to be fake. Therefore, the example and the links have been removed. Weiss, Weiss had written a column titled, We're All Fascists Now, explaining that the far left had been attacking even centrists as fascists. The point? Anti-fascism had gone so far that it was doing damage to even progressive causes. Central to the column was the example of Dave Rubin, a gay conservative activist who Barry Weiss pointed out had been attacked by the anti-fascist left. She said, Dave Rubin, a liberal commentator who favors abortion rights, opposes the death penalty, but is married to a man, yet is denounced as an anti-LGBT fascist and a fascist lieutenant for criticizing identity politics. So, All right, that's probably enough of that. <laughs> um, but I'd like to open up the chat. And uh, I'd like if people could just in the chat, um, tell me uh, what are some problems with this? Uh, what were some problems with this uh, video as, as, uh, as constructed? Um, let's see if we can get uh, a little critique uh, going here. Right. Flat delivery, right? Uh, no face. Now you can you can actually do videos without face, but there's no there's no real connection with the students. Uh, anything else that people want to uh, do? Uh, it doesn't seem just some words, right? Uh, it's the same words up there too, right? Um, not really comprehending what's being said. Um, the white background, which you know, the white background can be uh, it, you know, it's a bit it's a bit plain. Not much going on. Didn't know what you should pay attention to, uh, and actually, that's going to be a great that's going to be a great segue into our first thing. No context or relevance, right? Right. Uh, talking uh, at rather than with. No why, right? Not really getting across, um, you know, why we should care up front, right? Why why are you hearing this, right? So all of these things, all of these things uh, matter. Um, what I want to do today is talk about three techniques that come out of uh, come out of uh, what's called the the cognitive the cognitive theory of educational multimedia. I'm not going to go into the cognitive theory of educational multimedia, uh, but if you want to know more about the the why behind this, why why these techniques work, it's a term that you can um, uh, that you can look up and, and do a little more uh, a little more research on. Um, but the techniques that we're going to talk about today, sorry, we still have to arrange things a little bit here. We're going to talk about uh, three techniques. The first one is uh, signaling. The second one is segmenting. And the third one is weeding. And these are three techniques to try to produce a more effective educational video. There are also things that you do in the classroom, to be quite honest. Uh, so in some, in some ways, we'll be naming things that you already do. But in naming those things, I hope that uh, um, it makes uh, some of the connections between creating a video, uh, an educational video, and a, um, in a classroom presentation more evident. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this first one. Uh, signaling. I'm doing this uh, again just on one note here, um, working in a slightly smaller space than I, I, I normally do. Uh, but if you think about uh, any sort of lecture, right, you know, here is you, high definition drawing of you, the teacher, right, uh, talking. Um, and so you're kind of spitting out all these sort of facts and statistics and stories and methods and whatever you're talking about, right, kind of at the student. And the idea here is not that we have all these sort of fact marbles and the students are going to put the fact marbles in their fact marble bag, right? That's not, that's not the point. The point is this is sort of, a, you're giving the students sort of a constructor set, right? You're giving them the pieces, the facts, the statistics, 
uh, some of the insights, terminology. And the point is, as you talk, that the student is going to connect these together, right? You know, they're going to figure out how these things connect and they're going to reproduce uh, in their own mind something that is a mental model, something that is an understanding, right? So the point, right, is to get to this. Um, but this is hard stuff, right? This is hard stuff. The student doesn't necessarily know as all this stuff is coming at them, the student doesn't necessarily know what is important, what's a main idea, what's a sub idea. And so the idea of uh, using audio visual materials uh, is usually this, that one channel, in this case, we'll say that this is the audio channel, right? One channel, you're sort of handing them all that stuff, right? And in the other channel, let's say in this case, it's the visual channel. You're using the visual channel to give cues, right? To give hints about how to assemble it, right? So we, uh, we say, hey, okay, uh, we're gonna have a cue in the visual channel that says, look, this thing here, this, this little factoid or term or whatever, this is sort of the controlling idea for these two things, right? That's the main point. These are the sub points, right? This thing here, right? This is a very special term and we'll be coming back to that term. So you might wanna hold that term in your mind, right? Because we'll be doing more of that, right? And if this sounds familiar, right? If this sort of thing sounds familiar, using one channel to cue the other is because, you know, if you've used PowerPoint, you've done this in some way, right? Uh, the way that we generally use PowerPoint, um, you know, if it's used effectively, is that PowerPoint is sort of a map for the presentation, you know, here is, Here's the main idea, here's the sub idea. Here is our next idea, we're on to our next idea. Know that this idea here that we're talking about now is a new idea, it's not the last idea. Although maybe we'll refer back uh, to this other idea and talk about the connections. Uh, one thing that is important, so, so PowerPoint is a way of signaling. Uh, one thing I, if, one thing I, the, I wanna get uh, across here about the use of PowerPoint in the classroom is the signaling isn't only the PowerPoint in the classroom. And this is where a lot of people go wrong when they make their educational presentations, right? If you have a PowerPoint in the classroom and you're using that PowerPoint, you know, it's not just, right? It's not just about the PowerPoint. Let's take this out here. Um, it's not just about the PowerPoint, right? Uh, you, are, you are standing there, right? And what are you doing, right? You're pointing to various parts of the PowerPoint. You're saying, hey, you know, here we are on point number one, you know, now we're on this sub point, right? Uh, when you're calling back and saying, hey, this, uh, this next point relates to the first thing we're talking about, you're, you're pointing back, right? You're pointing back to that, right? So you're using your body in a combination with that PowerPoint. Uh, when you're online, of course, and you use the same PowerPoint, you're not signaling to the student, hey, this is where we are in the talk. You know, this is, this is the next point. We're coming up on the third point. And so the, the PowerPoint that might seem like it's pretty effective in the classroom is not gonna seem as effective online because you're not using your body. I, I, I really uh, encourage faculty to think about the ways they use their body in the classroom when they're making uh, uh, videos that are, are, you know, viewed outside the classroom. Because a lot of the places we go wrong is, is we don't, realize all the ways that we're using our physical body in the classroom to help students make sense of things. And because we're not realizing uh, what we do in the class, we, we don't necessarily realize it's gone when we produce educational multimedia. So just as an example, obviously the PowerPoint, you're pointing to different things on the PowerPoint and so forth. Um, you're also, um, one, I, one of the things uh, that I do, that a lot of faculty do is when we are, you know, when we're on the sort of, when we're on the main stretch here, right, the PowerPoint, you know, where, where am I when I'm on the main stretch, right? I'm here and I'm behind the podium, you know, paper chase John Hausman style, right? You know, um, when I go off on the tangent, right, when I say, you know, here's, let's explore this, what do I do, right? I get out, I get out from behind the podium. When we go back to the main thread, I get be back behind the podium, right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of things we do that sort of embody teaching in the classroom. Um, and if we just sort of transfer it and remove all that stuff without figuring out ways to replace it, uh, it ends up looking a little dead, right? It ends up looking a little dead online. Um, so signaling, 
is, is, uh, is, is the broad idea. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean when we're looking at, um, what does it mean when we're, when we're looking at uh, putting together an educational video? Well, it means you, you got to replace some of that stuff you do in the classroom, right? So uh, as an example, I'm, I'm here using OneNote, uh, but if I was using PowerPoint, uh, one of the things that I would be doing is not just putting up the PowerPoint and talking over the PowerPoint, but uh, I'd be just, uh, you know, marking, uh, marking parts of it. I might be underlining the part of the PowerPoint that I'm on, right? I might be uh, circling various terms, things like that, uh, trying to engage people uh, in that way. If I, if I don't have that, if I don't have, um, uh, we have uh, here, uh, you can see me in this really small piece. You can get one of these, if you don't have like a surface or some sort of touch screen, you get one of these really cheap, you know, $70, $60 uh, input boards. They allow you just to like circle things on a PowerPoint with a, uh, a little stylus. Um, it's worth it. It's really worth it. It really, it really will help. Uh, will help your, uh, will help your students. If you don't want to do that, just even setting up your PowerPoint so that as you go through it, it reveals those bullet points one by one, rather than throw them all at people at once, so that people know, oh, here we, here is where we are, in the, um, in the lecture. Uh, little things like that can help, right? So signaling, right? Giving students, uh, giving students those those cues. Uh, same thing. Uh, I I like even if I'm using a PowerPoint, if I introduce a new term uh, to students, right? So you know our new term is going to be uh, you know I don't know cognitive or something, right? I like to just write uh, you know write the term on the screen. Um, emphasize, hey, this is this is something you're gonna want to pay attention to this term. We're gonna come back to this term, right? So. Uh, so cognitive, something like that. So that's signaling, right? So signaling, again, we use the, uh, we use one channel to help organize the processing of another channel. It can work uh, the opposite way too. Um, I don't wanna go too much into this because we, we have two other techniques to get to. Uh, but uh, if you think about when you're demoing something, very often you'll have a video channel and you might be showing some math or something like that. And, everything the student needs to know about the math is probably in the video channel, right? Like the actual process or, uh, is, is being demonstrated, right? But what are you doing in the audio channel? It's just the same thing, but the opposite way. You're calling attention, you're saying, oh, pay attention to this. This part here, this is a three part sequence that all goes to get, right? So you're using the audio channel to help organize the student processing of the visual channel, right? So again, signaling. Just think about the ways in which you're using the visual channel to give students cues on how to process something. Um, I'll say one other thing, a lot of people have heard, well, don't, you know, don't read off a PowerPoint slide. And that's, uh, you know, in, in, in some cases that's, that's true. There are cases where you do wanna read. If, if you're showing students uh, something that, you know, for example, um, that the students are going to analyze. You probably you want to read that off of the slide, partially for accessibility reasons. Um, but the main reason why you don't read off PowerPoint slides is if you uh, if you're queuing, right? If that that uh, if that audio channel is just a complete replication of the of the video channel, right? Then you're not actually using one channel to help organize another. It'd be like a GPS that says, okay, uh, keep going, now go past the hydrant, now go, uh, go up to the corner, now go, you're going past the Kmart now, now you're going past the Walmart, um, you know, keep going here. You know, I mean, it would, the flow of that doesn't actually provide any benefits, it's, it just becomes a narration of what you're doing rather than providing uh, people cues to that overall structure. All right, second piece here, uh, let's talk about segmenting. Uh, and again, you'll know that this is all stuff uh, that you um, are already doing in class, right? Uh, so again, you know, here is you, high definition. I mean, people sometimes call me uh, the, um, the, the Picasso of the Northwest, right? Uh, so here's a high definition drawing of you. And you're, you're giving students all these sort of facts. And the idea is the students are gonna integrate those, right? But you know what, if you keep going, and going and going and going, you know, and 45 minutes later, right, you say, okay, now we start to integrate. 
the student doesn't even remember half of what you said, right? There have to be opportunities for the students to stop and integrate what you said. And so one of the things that we don't realize all the time we're doing in class is we actually segment, right? So we say, instead of thinking of this, people dislecture all the time and I really, I really kind of hate it, um, as if most of us are getting up and just talking for 45 minutes. I think some faculty even think maybe that's what they're doing, but they're not, right? They're, you're getting up, you're talking for 10 minutes and then you're saying, hey, what do you think of that? If people following that, does anybody have an example of that, right? So you're segmenting, right? You're, you're giving, giving a bunch of stuff and then you're saying, okay, let's pause, back off and let's have some time to integrate this. Let's have time to make those connections, right? Let's have time to turn this bag of fact marbles into like actual understanding, right? And then after you have that integration period, then you go on and you do the next thing. So one of the things that sometimes happens in video is because we don't have a live audience in front of us. We just think, well, I'll just do the whole, I'll just do the 40 minutes and then the students will do the homework assignment, right? But the same problem applies, right? The students get overloaded. They don't, um, they don't, uh, they don't have time to integrate. So by the time they get to the lecture, they haven't, they've lost what was at the beginning, right? And so uh, when we talk about segmenting, sometimes people get into this idea that it's going to be all this sort of, um, you know, MOOC-based super scientific stuff, right? Uh, where like, what's the perfect size of a video? Is it six minutes? Is it eight minutes? Uh, let's chunk it all up and have multiple choice questions. And that's not what I'm saying. There are many ways to segment. You can have, you know, you can have, if you really wanted to do a, I'm not recommending you do a 45 minute video, but if you really wanted to do like a 45 minute video, you could have a video that, you know, has segments where you kind of talk and then segments that really ask students to reflect. You don't necessarily have to make it into a whole bunch of separate videos. You could have those pauses in the video. You could tell students, hey, just pause it here and think about this, right? Um, you don't have to have multiple choice questions. A lot of times when people segment, the idea is, oh, we're going to have a video here, right? And then we're going to have multiple choice questions. And we're going to have a video here. And that might be okay for some stuff. I'm not here to tell you that's wrong. Um, but it can also get a little exhausting for students sometimes because they're just answering so many questions, especially these questions are all in the grade book. It just becomes really confusing. You have like a whole bunch of like little one point grades in the grade book from these quizzes and it, it can feel a little overwhelming. You can have students do something like have the students keep a, keep a um, have the students keep like a lecture notebook, right? And just tell them, hey, uh, at this point in the video, uh, pause it. And uh, if you could just write down a couple thoughts in your lecture notebook, right? And then, you know, submit it later as a, as a full thing, right? As, a, as for a participation grade or something, right? Have them keep it like, you know, so that it doesn't feel like, you know, death by a million paper cuts of like 80,000 multiple choice quizzes. Um, and again, I'm not here to diss the multiple choice quizzes. There are some disciplines where the multiple choice quizzes work pretty good, uh, pretty well, right? Um, mathematics, for example, is one. But uh, for some other courses, it can feel a little, um, a little like an HR training or something like that. All right. Uh, so again, segmenting. Segmenting is uh, segmenting is making sure that there are specific, um, making sure that there are specific um, pauses in your in your video in your presentation opportunities to integrate, uh, in that these don't there's not too much distance between them. I, I talked, we don't want to get super scientific MOOC. What is the ideal length for a video? Um, but around 10 minutes, if you're doing a, a presentation of any length, right? Um, you know, people start to get a little, a little stressed. I'm even pushing it here, you know, to be quite honest, right? Um, but I'm going to do one more and then we're going to get, uh, then we're going to get to uh, um, uh, some conversation. So the final one uh, is weeding. And uh, I, I kind of sort of joke, kind of sort of not joke uh, that uh, weeding is one of the hardest things for academics to, to do. So what, what is weeding? Uh, you're, you're pushing students all these facts, figures, statistics, techniques, right? right? The more that you push towards them, 
right? The more that you push towards them, the more uh, they kind of have to hold in their head, the more they got to figure out, is this a main point? Is this a sub point? Is this important? Is this not important? Um, sometimes the easiest thing is just to say, you know, this isn't important right now, right? Do I really need to give the students this particular knowledge at this particular point, right? And sometimes you don't. I'll give you an example with the presentation I'm doing right now. Um, I love the cognitive science of this. Um, uh, I would, and in my mind, if you don't understand the cognitive science, you don't fully understand segmenting, you know, weeding uh, and signaling. Uh, and I initially gave presentations on this and I would lay out the cognitive science and the chunk size of memory and all this stuff, right? But you don't, that's not what you need for the initial understanding, right? For the initial understanding, I just need to show you the techniques and maybe talk about and connect them to your, what you've done in the classroom, right? Um, and then later we can do the cognitive science. Now, a good way to think about weeding is there's a lot of stuff you do want to get to. You want depth in your classes, right? And so when you, when you sort of kill your darlings here, when you say, we don't really need that, we don't, and, and just sort of slim down what you're talking about, uh, you can feel like you're reducing a lot of complexity. But there's a solution to that. Uh, and uh, it's what um, a guy named Jerome Bruner uh, back in uh, the 1960s uh, called the uh, spiral curriculum. And the idea of the spiral curriculum is you present the simplest version of the idea first, right? And so you go and you eliminate and you say, what's the, what's the smallest possible uh, things I can communicate that can give people this understanding? And then you come back to it and you broaden it out a bit. You add a little more complexity, right? And then you go out and you add a little more complexity. But it's this sort of iterative process. You give people the simple version first and then you come back and you say, okay, now let's go in a little more depth. And sort of breaking things out that way uh, allows students to construct a very basic mental model first and then move to these uh, more complex mental models. Again, I think I'm naming a lot of stuff you already do. You just have got to think about the ways that you do it in these videos. The one thing I'll say about video uh, in weeding is this, that uh, video sort of sits uh, between uh, the literary world, right? So, um, you know, the world, the world of, the, of the written word in between the, the world of orality, right? Um, and you have to be a little more concise in your recorded video than you are in a lecture, right? Um, in a lecture, there's, just, there's just, a, just the nature of the medium is that it doesn't have to be as concise. A video, a video is a little bit, it's a little bit more towards that written side of the world where you're going to want to edit a little more aggressively um, and produce something that is a little more honed, not polished by the way, um, just a little more honed in terms of, of what you're trying to do. So again, uh, signaling, segmenting and weeding. So let's go back to our example video. And I apologize, my, my um, speaker monitor doesn't, uh, turn out to be quite um, loud enough to, to get the captions perfectly, but the captions in this aren't, uh, in this uh, example are not uh, as important as, um, as really just the general flow. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be all right here. So what I wanted to do with this video, uh, I wanna be clear here. You know, I, I produce actually a lot of polished videos uh, as well. And, and the point with this video was not to produce a, a polished video. I just wanted to show what maybe 10 minutes of effort, right, could do. And then when I say 10 minutes of effort, I mean just rethinking how to present this idea and, uh, and then recording it, right? What 10 minutes of extra effort could do uh, for the video that we saw at the beginning. Uh, and I hope, uh, as you watch this, you'll see some stuff around signaling and some stuff around weeding. Uh, segmenting, uh, I'll talk about it, it. The fit with this video is a little different than you might, uh, than might be apparent. Uh, but here, here, is, here is like a very minor upgrade because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about just making small changes to your explanations that make them 
a little more engaging, a little more understandable. Uh, and let's see if we can, I'll get my mic as close to the screen as we can here. He's very, very prominent individual, gut sourcing very wrong. Barry Weiss was a columnist at the New York Times. And she made a really significant error. This was back in 2018, but it's as relevant today as it was then. She cited a fake Twitter account as the one. Now, I'll show you the account that uh, caused all the problems. And actually, the tweet, the very tweet. And so as you can see here, this account up here is from an official old people. Oh, and uh, we'll come back to that. And it says, looks like the alt-right needs another reminder that Berkeley is our campus. No platform for racist, anti-LGBT, fascists on our campus. And it's referring to Dave Lee. So it's basically, uh, it's talking about deplatforming, deplatforming, which is a term that will come up again. And it means not allowing to speak at all. Deplatforming Dave Rubin, who is a conservative activist with some, uh, I think, problematic association with racists. But the thing that Barry Weiss focuses on here is this anti-LGBT. Uh, why? Because Dave Rubin is an out-of-the-closet gay man in a same-sex marriage. He's been a proponent of many LGBTQ rights. And so she focuses on that. Isn't this ridiculous, right? That Antifa has the gall to call Dave Rubin, who had to live in the closet uh, for so long, uh, came out, struggled with all this. They're calling him anti-LGBT. What has the world come to except, except for one little problem? This official Antifa account, it is a, it's a parody account. It's not associated with Antifa. It's not even associated with the left. It's an account that uh, both makes fun of the left in the United States and occasionally attempts to fool people, as in this case, it ended up fooling Barry Weiss. Okay, so um, here, let me uh, put that down there. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do in the chat here is uh, if people could think about that video and the difference between the first video and this video in terms of signaling and weeding. I'll talk about segmenting a minute in a minute and just talk about some of the things going on in that video. Again, very simple upgrades to your presentation that, that exemplify the, the signaling and the weeding uh, uh, piece here. Yeah, so we're calling attention to, to, to things. Uh, uh, and part of that is just the dragging the, the tweet in. One of the things we're doing is we're using um, the video to just pull in some examples for emphasis uh, and uh, you know visually reinforcing. Um, it's one thing to sort of read off a tweet. Uh, it's another thing to show the tweet, right? That's, that's a way of emphasizing and making something real. Uh, annotation makes a difference. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's uh, you, want, you understand the annotations both capturing, giving, your, uh, giving you something to do and focus on visually, while at the same time calling your attention to, hey, this is what we're talking about. Hey, notice this thing here, um, really emphasizing it. Um, yeah, so signaling, signaling definitely like, and again, it's not much more than the video, right? It's, it's a pen, it's maybe dragging one thing onto the screen uh, and encircling a bunch of things. I actually consciously didn't change the bullet points of the, of the PowerPoint here at all, right? It's the same bullet points. Uh, but we, we've, we've kind of walked through and encircled things, right? What about uh, weeding? Um, what, 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 so weeding is uh, where we remove extraneous stuff. And, and it's been a while since we looked at the first video in this class, but uh, does anybody, um, can anybody remember enough of that first video to think about the way in which the subject was presented a little differently? It's been, it's, you know, it's been, it's, 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 uh, it's been a minute uh, since, the, since the first video. Um, in the first video, um, I don't know if you remember this, it starts out in, in almost this very overly literary way, like um, a, a weird note appeared in the NYT and then we read the editor's note, right? Uh, 
um, a, a, a previous version of this, right? A previous version uh, of this article had this and that, and we read the full note and we talk a little more about Barry Weiss and so forth. Okay, we don't really need, like, we need to know only a couple things about Barry Weiss, right? NYT columnist, she's writing this column, it's called, We're All Fascists Now. We need to know only a few things about Dave Rubin, right? We need to know, look, he's a conservative activist, but he's also a gay man who has fought for LGBT uh, uh, QIA causes, although in his case, more LGBTQ, but um, that's all we need to know. We don't know, we, do, we don't, you know, we don't need to be like Ron Chernow here. We're not, we're not writing, you know, we're not writing the biography of Alexander Hamilton, right? We just need, people just need to know enough facts about these individuals to understand the point of the story. So we take a lot of that out. We don't have the editor's note, right? Uh, we, cut, we cut out a lot of that stuff. And the video isn't necessarily shorter, it's about the same length, but we spend that extra time just reinforcing the pieces that we wanna reinforce. Smaller points, but we just hit them a couple different ways, a couple different times, right? Um, and so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a piece of, um, uh, that, that's a piece of it too, the weeding. Now the segmenting piece uh, won't be immediately apparent because both of these videos are a couple minutes. And really I'm not advocating doing a whole bunch of two and a half minute videos. It's just, that's what fits into a workshop like this. Um, but one of the things that we're setting up in that video is you see, we pull that tweet in and um, maybe I can show where that video ends here. Um, all right, so we pull that, we have that tweet up there, it looks like the alt-right. Um, I've got something in my mind. I am ending this video and I'm ending it in a way that's going to have a, a moment of integration. So at the end of this video, uh, what I would probably say in a, a textual comment, or maybe I could add it to the video itself, is I say, okay, here's a link you know, to that tweet or to an archived version of that tweet that Barry Weiss uh, mistakenly um, thought was real. Um, do a couple minutes of your own investigation and tell me what else can you find out about this account, right? Right? So I'm making sure that I end this, that I'm moving uh, through this video. I'm ending on a point here uh, where we're going to push the students to do a, just a short integration exercise. It doesn't have to be something that big. As, as, as I said, I want to stress that um, the integration can just be, you know, pause for a second, think about this, write a sentence in a journal, right? Um, one of the things that we're seeing from students uh, at WSU and everywhere is that a lot of students, um, as they move into more online based classes, are feeling that they're really behind. This is a little bit of a tangent of myself. If I, if I was giving this in a classroom, I'd walk out from behind the podium now and, you know, we'd, we'd go off on, a, on our tangent. Um, but a lot of students are feeling that overwhelmed because they feel they're really behind um, in a way that they haven't felt behind. And there is some talk uh, among instructional designers online that some of the students may really be behind. We're in a pandemic and students have a lot, of, yeah, everybody is just, my daughter was just saying uh, earlier, you know, it's not, that, it's not that I'm failing these classes uh, in high school, it's just that I'm so done. And I thought about that, I'm like, I'm like, that's the phrase, right? That's the phrase of the pandemic, you know, and, and that's the phrase that describes our student experience. This describes everybody, right? We're all just so done, right? We're all just so done. So a lot of, a lot of what students are feeling is just that. But there's another thing going on, which is that a lot of instructors have taken this idea of formative feedback and students, uh, you know, testing, you know, an incremental assessment and all this stuff. All good, all good, like all really good um, pedagogical practice, right? But there's so much of it. There's so many little assessments, right? That when they look at a week, they just feel like, you know, there are like 18 quizzes here. The quizzes might be like one question, right? But there's 18 quiz, I'm like, I just, they feel just very behind, right? Uh, and so, um, again, you can still do those short little quizzes, but
But if you can make that feel a little less like 18 separate little checks, the way it does in the classroom, where it's just sort of, it feels a little more informal, right? If you can make it like, uh, just write a, write a note in your journal, pause, pause here, write a couple things in your journal, where it doesn't feel like they're being assessed 18 times a day, but they're still reflecting, doing something like that uh, can, make, uh, can make a real, uh, real difference. So uh, what I have now, we've talked about segmenting, weeding, right, and signaling. Um, I thought we'd, uh, we'd open up the discussion. I'd uh, take questions. Uh, um, Robin, should I just leave these, uh, should I just leave the slide up so that we can have the captions? I think it's great have the captions if yeah. people don't mind. And just remember folks that you can tweak your Zoom um, visual presentation however you want. So if you want to see just the active speaker, you want to shrink things. So play around till you get a delivery that, that you like. Um, as you can see, the chat has been incredibly lively. Um, people very interested in the bag of marbles. Um, and that <laughs> was about uh, 40 minutes worth of chatting about what we are all going to do with marbles in our classes now. <laughs> um, but I think there are lots of interest. And, and Mike, the one thing I really did notice in the chat is people are definitely meta processing this because they are really also loving how you are presenting this presentation and thinking about how they can replicate um, some of the well-planned but informal. Um, so I think you're really modeling a lot of what you're teaching, obviously. Um, so folks, we have about 40 or so people in here. Um, I think a great way to organize this would just be to use the raise hand function if you can. Um, and then we'll just have you unmute and, and ask your question. You can also um, use the chat to throw in throw in questions, but I think it'd be great to get some other voices. So does anybody want to kick us off with a question or comment based on Mike's stuff? Um, Amy, why don't you go ahead? Hi, so Mike, thanks a lot. Uh, I had a question about the very last thing you said. And so I've, I've used like in the classroom face-to-face -face free writing exercises in their in their notes so that they can reflect and do those pauses and the segment thing like you mentioned. And I'm curious about that in the online environment. Is that something that we can ask them? I, we can ask them to do whatever, right? But like, is it effective to ask them to journal in a Google Doc that's shared with us so that we are sort of a, not necessarily assessing the content of their answers, but more along the lines of giving them a reason to engage by being able to reflect back on what they're saying in that? Or is that too intrusive, right? Because sometimes I don't, you I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I mean I don't think it's too intrusive to to have them share a share a Google Doc with you where they they I mean it depends what your purpose is, right? But I mean if they know that uh, that you'll be looking at the Google Doc, um, I mean there's some benefits to that too, right? I, I think uh, if we know that you know, students have a, a sort of a love hate <laughs> relationship with the things that teachers look at. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's like they, they have to submit all this work and the teacher's watching them and, and so forth. Um, um, but also students like to know when they do work and when they do reflection that the teacher notices, right? Um, and sometimes it makes them take it a little more seriously, right? So um, you actually get students uh, upset if they write a full journal and, and you never look at it. They feel like they, they've been uh, uh, cheated a little bit. So I, I think absolutely, I think you could, you could do it where you say, look, you know, share that with me. And I'm not going to be looking at necessarily everybody's every day, but uh, before the class, maybe I'll go and I'll look at a few and I'll pull out some comments uh, that people made and I'll integrate those into the classroom, um, which is also incidentally is a good way to solve some of the feedback problem, right? So one of, one of the problems with online is students want a sort of level of feedback and, and you want them to um, expect that in a way that motivates them, but to give all students feedback, uh, you know, across all these different prompts and everything would just, it's just too much work. Um, but a technique where uh, students journal, uh, make some notes on, on these things, and then you go into a couple, uh, a couple of these things, and in your presentation for the class, you are pulling and calling out and saying, look, uh, you know, so-and-so, um, you know, if the, as long as you tell the students, look, you, you may name their comments or, or whatever, um, or one student, 
they'll know who made the comment. One student mentioned this, you know, another student mentioned this. Then they're seeing, hey, you're reading this, you're actually paying attention, you're modifying uh, your practice for it. It's a way of um, uh, recognizing that work without having to go through speed grader every 20 minutes and uh, look at all of it. If, if you're on Canvas speed grader, if you're on Blackboard, whatever their speed grader knockoff is. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously the big thing with this is, is be really transparent with students. Um, and, you know, it may differ on subject too. We have some human development classes here at WSU. People talk about some very controversial, very personal topics. Um, um, you might, you might not be able to integrate that some of the responses in your classroom, uh, they might be too personal, right. Um, but just uh, figure out what works for your class. And, and absolutely, I, I think having the students share that um, uh, can be good. And, and, and I think, uh, to some extent, the students want that the students want you to see their effort. They don't want to feel like they're just writing into the void. Um, Mike, lots of folks are interested in something that I think you do um, with students quite a bit, which is maybe um, flipping this a bit and having students participate in making explanatory videos and maybe teaching them some of the techniques here. Um, can you talk a little bit about making media with students? Because I know you've done that and um, mm -hmm. how do you sort of talk to students about um, sort of media literacy. So like, as we're learning these things, these are also really helpful things students will have to do in all sorts of fields when they graduate. Um, what are some cool ways that you've seen professors um, flip this around and do this kind of stuff with students? Yeah, so absolutely. So a couple of things with that. Uh, um, you know, you, first don't assume that all your students, you know, are you know, this, this term digital natives from years ago, they, they, your students uh, have these skills natively, right? I mean, you're going to have to assist students or provide them some support either on a student to student basis, teacher to student basis to make these things. And you have to give the students time uh, to make these sort of things. By the way, I, I shouldn't be talking about this at all. I should just hand it off to Martha, who I think is, is probably like, to my mind, the national expert, maybe the international expert on um, really creating student-based media. The one thing I would say though is uh, uh, with student media, um, like short is a blessing, right? Uh, getting students to really kind of come up with condensed media pieces. Um, you know, uh, 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 Martha and, and uh, um, uh, the UMW people even had students like capture, capture this idea as a meme you know that sort of thing, right? Where it might just be an image that you look at that the students uh, the students can uh, construct, but it shows some understanding. Uh, one thing I'll say uh, too, when you think about short pieces of media, is that they can be um, they can be a sort of like an adjacent supportive piece to something else as well. Uh, you have all of these people who are kind of going out of their minds about well, what if students you know plagiarize you know, plagiarize their essay or, or something like this. And we've got to get like 18 levels of surveillance, surveillance on students to make sure they don't cheat. Because what if, you know, what if they, what if they take someone else's work? And, you know, and, and cheating matters, right? I think, I think we should treat cheating with some moral seriousness. Um, but, you know, a simpler way rather than having, you know, building the new panopticon, uh, is to have students, for example, they can write a paper into the term paper, and then they can produce a short video of them talking about, like a four minute video talking about what excited them about their paper, you know, um, what they learned by it. And they can produce that video in a way that's gonna give you a pretty good sense of confidence that, you know, someone else didn't write the paper for them, or at the very least, if someone wrote the paper for them, they understand what's actually in the paper, right? So you could have, for example, a combination student produces a paper and then student just does a personal video talking about, hey, here's what I learned. Here are the things I really want you to notice about this paper. Um, if I was going to talk about this paper, if I was going to write a follow on paper, here's what I would explore. Um, and what you might find too is that that brings out some students that 
didn't quite pull off their paper, maybe when they talk about their paper, you actually understand that the student, the student didn't do so well on the paper because actually their mind is, they, they, have, they know too much, you know, they're too excited. Um, you know, I was always a, a kid in, in uh, college where the more I cared about the paper and the more I knew, the worse the paper was because I, I, I could never finish it. I just keep throwing it away, you know. Um, and having a video where students talk about, here's what I learned, here's what I was interested, in, might give you some insight into the paper that you nor don't normally get, right? So think about, think about things in that way, that uh, even if you have some more traditional exercises, some of these media pieces produced by students uh, could, be a, could be a pairing that uh, really helps them um, exercise their, their whole capability. Video author's notes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Video author's notes. I have to have them annotate the paper, right? Have them like, hey, just pull up your paper, screencast your paper and say, I'm gonna walk you through my paper. Uh, you know, first let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about uh, this thesis here. Uh, you know, let's talk about uh, this example is really interesting. Uh, this is where I found it. This is why I used it. Just have the students annotate their paper and talk through that. Many different ways you can do that. And, and uh, things like TikTok, um, you know, even though it's a Chinese surveillance software, it's also very fun. I'm very conflicted about TikTok. Um, but that idea of really condensing things, um, summary, uh, um, you know, trying to get the, the big idea, I mean, it's just a really powerful exercise. Um, um, I, I could do a whole presentation just about how underused summary is as a, as a teaching technique, uh, just having students trying to summarize things in a couple of sentences, but another presentation. Um, we have uh, just about five minutes left. Does anybody Panopta want to fun? What? Whoever Liz A is is cracking me up. Panopta fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Liz will do that, and she's master of uh, master of the chat. Um, so yeah, I think we do have time for one more question if anybody has it. Um, and then just to remind you that the collab staff, um, we will generously dismiss Mike and then the collab staff will be sticking around until 11 if you just want to debrief anything from uh, Mike or Martha um, or talk about plans for the future. Does anybody have a last question for um, Mike? You can, um, it looks like Amy has put her hand back up. Go for it, Amy. I have, sorry, this one refers to segmenting and I was curious if there's any cognitive science that shows how much segmenting we should do in a like 50 minute section session, right? So yeah. is it every five minutes? Is it, you you said at one point a video, maybe like 10 minutes could be optimal. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a bunch of research on this. Although a lot of it comes out of MOOCs, a lot of MOOCs are on, you know, very specific disciplinary subjects. There's a tendency to bias towards uh, engineering, uh, math, computer science, those sorts of things. Um, and, uh, uh, but the, the, the findings are roughly this, um, that, you know, go up to, go up to six minutes and don't worry about anything. Right. I mean, like, no worries up to the six minutes. There's a slight decline, but relatively slight between about six minutes and about 12 minutes or so, right? But it's so slight that like a lot of people are like seven, seven point two minutes is the precise amount of time. They're talking about a very slight decline after seven minutes, right? A very slight decline. Uh, it's really not worth stressing about. There's so many other things you could do to improve your video besides chopping off those minutes if you want those minutes. Uh, after about 12 minutes, um, people, people need something, right? 12, uh, you know, maybe 15, people need something. But the thing I want to really, because again, you don't want students to be overloaded, the thing I really want, one of the reasons why we call out segmenting as a term, as a concept, rather than just say, hey, split your videos, is we want people to understand that the concept is bigger than do short videos, right? You can have the 45 minute video with the scheduled pauses in it, right? You can do this in other, in other, sorts, of, in other sorts of ways. Uh, you can even, maybe your lecture style is such that you, you back off and you have something that kind of allows the students to integrate in the way that you're, you're presenting. Um, 
And the reason why I, the reason why I think this is important is again, I've seen people take the cognitive science and do really bad things like, hey, I'm going to break up my 50 minute lecture um, into nine separate videos, right? And, you know, um, nine, nine, is, nine is borderline, let's, let's say 12. Uh, student looks and sees 12 videos. And uh, in their impression of that is, is I, you know, I'm done. <laughs> I'm so done. Um, uh, so the point of segmenting and the point of the, you can do the short videos. And again, in math, uh, in, you know, in some areas of, of science, not all, but some areas of science where you're going through very specific concepts, um, in engineering, sometimes those short videos work really well. Specific subject, go through it, apply it immediately, do the math, write the code, do whatever. Um, so it can be really appropriate. Um, but what, what, I, what I think is really just at about 12 minutes, you're, you're doing something different. You're either slowing down in a way, maybe you're pulling out an example and you're talking through an example in a way that's less cognitively intensive, right, in the video. Maybe you're telling them to pause and write something down. You're doing something by about 12 minutes, certainly by 15, um, but, but don't listen to the people that are like 7.2 minutes is the perfect video and all videos above that are, uh, you know, are a, a blemish in the eyes of God. That's, that's not, that's, that's BS. Um, I will jump in and um, thank Mike so very much for this presentation and remind you all that um, we will post his outline along with this recording right on the Jumpstart page. Um, it usually takes us a little while to get all that uploaded um, and it will take even longer if Martha gets um, somehow mauled by her dog and isn't available to assist. Um, so Mike, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to pop out. And uh, Mike, can you throw into the chat your um, Twitter handle? Because yeah. I do want to let y'all know that uh, Mike is very accessible on Twitter. So, you know, if, if something strikes you in a couple of days and you want to pop a question over, um, you can you can find him there and um, and send him a note, which I will tell you is going to be a lot easier for him than everybody sending him an email. So that would be great. Uh, so thanks so much, Mike. I'm going to stop recording.